Professor Gross, Jamie, Harrison, we're going to get started in just a second. So. Um, uh, great to see you all here. Thank you. Great to have you all here for day two of the Yale Innovation Summit. Um, the early birds get the carbon insight, so thank you all for showing up bright and early at 8.30. Uh, again, my name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the executive director of the Yale Center for Business and the Environment which is the joint initiative between the School of Management and the School of the Environment and working with Yale Ventures on the climate track of the Innovation Summit. Um, uh, really excited today. Uh, we get to feature lots of different parts of the university and collaborators and friends. Um, we're going to start out here with a wonderful panel on um, carbon dioxide removal. Um, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. We've also got faculty um, that will be speaking. Julie Zimmerman is up here in the front row. She's our next speaker that you get to hear from. You're going to see pitches from lots of the folks who are in the audience right now, a uh, wonderful set of students and alumni um, who will be pitching. Um, Tony from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication will be here later to give you insight on public opinion and attitude on climate change. Um, and then we're going to get to hear about portfolios in the circular economy, like how do we think about investing in that space. At the end, we're going to have an informal session as well at 3.30, not on the agenda, but special for all of you, to hear from Connecticut Innovations and from Climate Haven and anyone else on what support, engagement, activity we can all offer each other to kind of take a conversation here into a meaningful action tomorrow. Um, so. We are thrilled that we get to start off this morning um, featuring one of the things that people are always wondering about Yale is like, why are there so many different centers of innovation? Like, there are all these different places that I can go and like things that I can find in pockets. You've got like a center for green chemistry and engineering here. You know, you got the center, you got the carbon containment lab that's represented here. And there's just this like amazing pocket of expertise that you can find all around the university. And one of the things that you'll see on the slide here is that um, our moderator, Anastasia O'Rourke, who's the managing director of the carbon containment lab, actually is containing her own sickness this morning. So she decided that she was not going to be a super spreader, but she was going to actually keep everybody healthy. She's got a cold. We're not really sure. It's a, you know, a little bit of the sniffles. Luckily, there's like a left, right brain, right, left hand at the carpet containment lab, Justin Freiberg, um, who was actually, you know, like small little bit of personal history, 
beat me and Casey Pickett in an innovation competition about 13 years ago to win Yale's Innovation Prize um, and sustainability. Um, so I'm still smarting from that. I'm trying to make up for it. I um, uh, haven't quite gotten there yet. But Justin is going to lead us in a dialogue and a discussion with three lovely alumni um, who represent all different parts of a kind of carbon dioxide removal system, buyers, entrepreneurs, innovators, um, and I will leave it and kick it over to Justin to get us going for the day. Thanks for being here, everybody. Thank you very much, Stu. I think, Thank you, Stu. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. I'm going to try to go really quickly, because here's the, the three people are here to hear from. So ever so quickly, I want to tell you what we're going to be talking about, center you in on the problems, and then how we're approaching this via solution building. The Yale Carbon Containment Lab, which I'll tell you about ever so briefly here, um, was uh, founded in, in 2020 by Dean Takahashi, who had helped lead the Yale Endowment for more than three decades. We are 12 people strong. We have 12 to 15 interns at any one point and 20 or so collaborators from both inside and outside of Yale. Um, we work on applied projects. We look at anthropogenic, biologic, and geologic solution building. And again, we, um, we're looking across the gamut at this huge, the scale of this issue and how we can approach it pragmatically and economically. So we look at both at mitigations, removal, as well as storage. And apologies, again, late step in here. I'm working off of somebody else's slides. So I'll do my best. Um, so this, I think, might be a graph that is uh, you know, hopefully not totally new to everybody here, which is that per the title of the, uh, the day, we're going to have to do a lot in the next 10 years, but for that matter, we're gonna to have to do a lot in the next 80 years, as you see here. Um, we at the Carbon Containment Lab think about both carbon emissions uh, reduction as well as carbon removal. And today we're gonna to be focusing on carbon removal. You can see that any model, most of all, nearly all, uh, model pathways that keep us down to 1.5 or two degrees C warming necessitate not only carbon reductions, but well as, as well as carbon removal. Again, at the lab, we focus on both. But within, within carbon removal, uh, we like to look at a lot of the different topics that we're talking about today, both on geologic storage as well as anthropogenic and biologic. To get there, how are we going to get there? Luckily, uh, this is not a silver bullet approach. This is a silver buckshot moment. You'll see that here's the taxonomy. This is not the taxonomy. This is a taxonomy of how we can start to think about carbon removal. You can piece and parse this how, however you want. But what's uh, hopeful to me, and I'm trying to be a pragmatic optimist today, uh, per Stu's earlier message, is that we're starting to think about different ways to do this, uh, not just one approach. And I would venture to guess that in 10 years from now, this will have branched threefold, fourfold. Um, in particular, I guess what I, what, I'm, what I want to stress is that if you were to dive into any one of these and think about how you build a solution, in regards to the you know, three or two keywords you see here, you're going to need expertise from across fields, and you're going to need a huge amount of capital to get these things deployed. We're at a very nascent stage here, very, very nascent, as we'll hear from some things. However, we're moving, um, and it's really exciting, uh, but we're going to need a ton of smart people, a ton of expertise from across fields, and we're going to need capital, both at the beginning of these as well as in terms of buying and supporting these solutions. So on that front, let me just quickly move into introductions here. So uh, our first panelist that we'll hear from is Annie Gua, who is a carbon removal buyer from Microsoft. Annie graduated uh, in 2018 from the Yale School of the Environment with an MEM. At Microsoft, she joined the European Energy Markets team working on data center development and is now a buyer for its carbon removal program, which is really leading the market by offering forward purchase contracts that can be catalytic and non-dilutive capital for early stage companies. Next, we will hear from two Yaleys who are now entrepreneurs uh, active in carbon management about their approaches and experiences. Then we'll have a short panel moment where we can do some Q&A and maybe we'll have time for a few questions from the audience. 
Um, but let me talk about uh, Staff Sheehan really quickly. He graduated from Yale with a PhD in physical chemistry in 2016 and co-founded the Air Company in 2017, where he is now CTO. Mary Yap is a, the co-founder and CEO of Lithos Carbon. She's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, she had held leadership positions in two technology startups before coming to Yale College. And upon graduation in 2021, she found, co-founded Lithos, raised VC funds, and has built the team to really advance one of the uh, foremost approaches to uh, enhanced mineral weathering. So with that, Annie, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks very much. And thanks for starting your day with us. It's really early, and I really appreciate you being here. Um, so by way of introduction, I'm on the carbon removal team. But my background is actually in energy. If you encountered me at school here, you, you would have remembered me as somebody just like flitted around energy system classes and like any finance class that would teach me how to get people to eventually put more money towards energy systems. Um, but it turns out a lot of those skill sets translate very well to this nascent industry of carbon removal. Um, so I'll talk about what Microsoft is doing within the sustainability commitment space, what we're doing within carbon removal specifically, and how we think about our portfolio and stacking all of those technologies that Justin mentioned. I'll tell you about what our target is and our go-get, and then a little bit about our portfolio to date. So I sit within the broader sustainability commitments group within Microsoft's corporate sustainability function. And our goals, which were recently refreshed and uh, pushed out into the world in 2020, are largely around these four areas. So we want to be carbon negative by 2030. We want to be water positive by 2030. We want to be zero waste by 2030. So 2030 is a big year for us. Um, and then lastly, we are using the internal might of Microsoft Digital to create what we're calling a planetary computer giving folks across various industries, uh, focusing on academic and nonprofit spaces, uh, the tools to create tools of their own and empower our customers and others in our orbit to do what they can to advance the climate agenda. And so this is a snapshot of what we published in 2020 when we shared with the world that we want to be carbon negative. Um, I'm not going to go into the numbers too much, but what I want you to take away is, like everybody else, our approach is to reduce what we can and remove the rest. And what that means for Microsoft is we're reducing over 50% of our emissions, and then we're removing the remainder. And for us in 2030, that remainder is going to look like over 5 million tons. And that's the projection today. Uh, I know we talked a little bit about AI yesterday and what that means for energy intensity and demand at data centers and other spaces that are going to be key to driving that AI future. Um, I don't know if that's all factored in here yet. So we could see these numbers evolve in the next couple of years as we quantify that impact. <laughs> Uh, Justin mentioned a slew of different technologies that fit within the hierarchy, not hierarchy, family tree of carbon removal. Uh, and so in this slide, I just want to share that different groups might think about the durabilities differently of those pathways, but for Microsoft, we group them into three different buckets. One is low durability, so less than 100 years. A lot of our nature-based projects fit in there. The other is medium durability. We see a lot of biochar today. We're also experimenting with ocean carbon and deep sea kelp sinking, as an example. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of hype right now with the high durability category, which today is maybe less than 1% of the total CDR supply. Uh, but that includes stuff like direct air capture, uh, enhanced rock, um, sorry, mineralization, and uh, some bioenergy carbon capture and storage. All of these have different risks and different pros. And so as we think about quality, we're really digging into what is the reputational risk, what is the development of MRV, how are communities impacted when we go and think about building a CO2 pipeline, for instance. There's like a lot of parallels to what we've done wrong in the past. And so as we approach these different pathways and think through what a just transition looks like, what the energy transition looks like, we're also keeping a lot of these aspects of quality first and front of mind. And this is my last slide, but this is a snapshot of our portfolio to date as of the end of FY22, which would have been uh, June 30th, 2022. We're about to publish our FY23 snapshot, but as you can see, 
the majority of what we've purchased is in the net nature-based space. And to give you an idea of what 2030 looks like to us from a portfolio breakdown perspective, we expect about half of that portfolio to still be nature-based and half of it to be engineered. And again, I mentioned earlier that today, 99% of what we buy, of what the market has, is in the nature-based space. And as we head towards 2030, we are not forgetting about the trees by any means, but we are trying to amplify and grow markets that target some of the more high durability oriented pathways so that we can get to a place where Microsoft is not the biggest buyer in the market, that there's a lot of options for everybody to buy into so they can all meet their net zero goals. Um, and that quality has been front of mind throughout that entire process. Thank you. And and move into your slides, hopefully. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> I'm co-founder and chief technology officer at Air Company. Um, and at Air Company, what we do is we are carbon, util carbon dioxide utilization business. That means we're more active carbon management. Um, we take carbon dioxide from the air or point sources, mix that with green hydrogen, which is hydrogen that's produced via water and renewable electricity. Um, and we produce the products that you get from fossil fuels, except from essentially the air. Um, the reason that we do this is because the biggest problem that we have right now, and for, as far as climate change goes, is our reliance on fossil fuels. So if we, if we can replace fossil fuels with fuels that are made from renewable resources, then we've made a big contribution towards solving the problem. This is how our technology works, you can see on the slide. Don't worry, this is my busiest and wordiest slide, so the rest of them is downhill from here. Um, our feedstocks are carbon dioxide. We capture it from industrial sources, the air, many different places, um, and green hydrogen. So that's hydrogen that's produced using renewable electricity. Right now we use wind and solar in uh, water electrolysis. So we take H2O and split it into H2 and O2. The only emission in this entire process is oxygen gas. Uh, so the oxygen just goes into the atmosphere and makes it nicer to breathe. Uh, we're based in Brooklyn, New York, so there are a lot of people that need to make it nicer to breathe in Brooklyn, New York. Um, the process that we that we that we've innovated on, and in that in the um, in the square with the dark background, that that's all our patented and proprietary intellectual property in the business. Um, we pass the carbon dioxide and hydrogen into a reactor with a catalyst in it. I did my PhD focused on catalysis here at Yale, so that's really my expertise from a technical perspective. Um, we then separate out the products that come out of that reactor and distill them and purify them. Um, we make different products. Our major product and the most important one to us that can address over 3% of the entire climate change problem uh, is our sustainable aviation fuel because aviation is a really hard to decarbonize sector. For light vehicles and cars, you're going to be able to use a battery to decarbonize that, but you're never going to be able to do a long haul flight with a battery. You need a high energy density liquid fuel and it needs to drop in and uh, you know replace the existing fossil fuel. And that's what we do. We're actually the only business in the world that sells a fully drop-in fuel, um, and that's because right now we sell most of our fuel to the United States Air Force. Um, and uh, the other products that we make were, were developed so that we could generate revenue as a business as we scale. Um, and they're actually really important because right now we operate this, um, this facility. You can go on to the next slide. We operate this, this facility in Brooklyn, New York. It's a pilot plant. Uh, this is actually our, our third system that, we've, we, uh, that we operate. So we operate laboratory scale reactors to do research and development on how to build this process on a really large scale. We operate prototype scale reactors, and then we operate this, which is a pilot plant. In order to build big oil refinery sized, you know, renewable refineries essentially, or refineries that make fuel from fuel without the fossil, um, you need to do a lot of research and development at this scale, at this large, uh, you know, fairly large pilot scale. And when you're doing R&D at this scale, you're typically just burning cash um, and you don't make any money as a business. Uh, what Air Company does differently is um, we actually take the byproduct of this and we sell it as consumer goods. So fuel typically sells for you know, $2.50 a gallon for jet fuel. Premium vodka, on the other hand, sells for about $500 a gallon. <laughs> Premium fragrance, which I think we have enough samples for the whole class, um, if you want to take one on your way out, uh, sells for around $20,000 a gallon. So that's how we're monetizing our research and development to scale our technology, by selling these premium products. And they sell out. The vodka... Um, 
We tried to set, put it into retail. It sold out within 30 seconds. Now we can only sell it in a handful of bars and restaurants in New York. And we, this pilot plant that you see here is producing all of it and uh, struggles to keep up with demand from just 10 Michelin star restaurants. Um, so um, the products have been a pretty big hit. Um, but the scope of what Air Company is doing is much broader than just our consumer goods. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, so we've, with our backers and with, uh, you know, so we're backed by, you know, for example, JetBlue is one of the investors in our business. Um, and we have several other aviation industry investors. Uh, together with the groups that, uh, you know, have backed us and that we've partnered with, we've signed term sheets for over a billion gallons and projected projected sustainable aviation fuel sales. So that's significantly tackling um, the United States goals for 2030 for sustainable aviation fuel. And then on the next slide. The biggest emitter uh, of aviation-based, uh, you know, carbon emissions is, is actually uh, the U.S. Air Force, so the biggest buyer of fuel, um, the biggest Air Force um, in in the world. Does anybody know what the second biggest Air Force in the in the entire world is? It's the U.S. Navy. Um, so we uh, uh, we work together with with these groups um, not only because being able to generate fossil fuels from you know essentially air, water, and sunlight. Um, you know, will help these groups be greener and help them be, uh, uh, you know, more climate conscious and climate friendly, um, but also is key to American energy independence. Um, then we don't have to rely on supply chains for fossil fuels in, you know, from places where we don't necessarily want to get fossil fuels. Um, we don't want to get fossil fuels from anywhere, period. Um, so this is critical to both our energy independence and, uh, you know, fighting climate change. So that's our company. Thank you, staff. I think we're just going to wait a second while we get the slides up. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Yep. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Really excited to, to talk with you guys about a slightly different method of um, tackling sustainability. So we're kind of a nature-based solution, but also kind of an engineered solution. We're lithos carbon. There's actually a process in nature, which we are inspired by, that's incredibly scalable and also usable now to capture carbon permanently. And it's called enhanced rock weathering or enhanced mineralization. How that works is actually um, making a quick analogy. When CO2 is circulating around the atmosphere, up, up there, it actually combines with rainwater in the clouds to create something we've all heard about acid rain technically carbonic acid. And when that acid rain falls down and hits special kinds of rocks across the world, it leads to a special chemical reaction where that CO2 is transformed into HCO3 minus, technically called bicarbonate. It's what seashells are made out of, that chalky stuff. And it can be stored for 10,000 years or longer. Those bicarbonates can flow off in the rivers and the groundwaters into the open ocean. They can become the shells of phytoplankton or seashells, things like that. And ultimately, the goal is long-term storage in the deep ocean for up to 100,000 years. It's an incredibly powerful process. It actually already removes about 1 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere every single year, and it's done that for 4.5 billion years. So geologists like myself like to say that without this one process on Earth, we actually would look a lot like Venus with greenhouse gases everywhere. Like, it would not be habitable. So what we do at Lithos Carbon is we take that natural process that we already know is very powerful, and then we try to speed that up by about 100 to 1,000 times, depending on certain kinds of deployment settings. So this research Research has been underway for close to about a decade. Different researchers across the world have been tackling this, trying to figure out how do you make this effective. And that's really what we are deploying, scaling, and researching at Lithos Carbon. So this is an image of how it works. So um, these are real pictures from farms today um, and from our sources. So I like to say that the idea is very simple in theory. You know, take some rock dust, which will have more surface area than a big hunk of rock out in a mountain, and that will hopefully capture carbon faster, right? Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the reality and the reason we have built a company around this is that it's not quite so simple. I often say it's also a little bit like baking. I've tried to make sourdough in the pandemic. It, it never worked for me. Um, I just don't have my mom's um, skill at making bread. And it's because it's a very precise art and a precise science. Temperature matters. The quality of the ingredients matter. All these different details really change how the bread is made. Without that, you've just got ingredients. So what Lithos does is a few different steps, if you go to the next slide. So one, we've sourced really strong, um, really good basalt finds. Basalt is actually a black volcanic rock. That's stuff you see in Game of Thrones or all of Hawaii, all of Iceland. That's basalt. It's a silicate mineral. And it does two things. One, it can capture carbon permanently. And two, 
and also can improve crop yields. We look for basalt waste dust. We are actually building a circular economy. We do not crush up our dust. Um, we do not make it. We don't have to have any new emissions from it. It's actually something that's produced in the millions of tons across the world and in America today um, when folks are mining this special volcanic rock for use in other things like concrete or roofing tiles, etc. We find very, very fine particles with the right chemistry and mineralogy to capture carbon very effectively. And we run a lot of different tests on that. But beyond that, the actual key to scaling this up is you need to make sure that it happens efficiently. Um, we found in our research that actually if you just spread random deaths, it often takes decades, so many decades to capture carbon. And so the trick here is we've actually developed a lot of software that helps us better understand the unique biogeochemistry of every single place that we choose to deploy this. We work with farms and understand the different parameters that help us make that process happen faster. So instead of taking decades, it can take a couple of years. So in short, we get soil tests from the different farmers that we work with. We plug data into our software. We're able to take this upcycled basalt dust in the millions of tons, deploy that, and improve crop yields while also capturing carbon permanently. Next slide. So there's a couple of different things I want to talk about here. One of them is why do farmers want this and why is this scalable? And the second one is MRV and the importance of credibility in building an enduring carbon market. The first side, scale. So my family are actually smallholder farmers in Taiwan. Um, actually, a lot of our team, about a third of them, have worked on farms before, studied farms, worked in soil science. And this is actually the reason that we're so excited about enhanced rock weathering. It's naturally scalable. Farmers already use other rock dust today, and they pay a lot of money to do this. And they just have to do that or else the crops won't grow, their topsoils will erode, and their soils will get too acidic over time from the use of nitrogen and synthetic fertilizers. The cool thing is lithos is actually substituting for something farmers already use today, limestone dust, and doing a better job. And that's partially because we've done so much research um, over the last decade to make sure that this works. So on every farm that we deploy, we're substituting for something they already use. Um, we're actually able to give this for free to our farmers. And beyond that, it also improves their crop yields. In some of our live farms today, we've improved crop yields up to 47%. So it's a no-brainer for farmers. Additionally, no additional equipment is required. Farmers can use the exact same equipment they've used for decades. So it's a very simple change practice. It seems almost sometimes too good to be true for the farmers, but that's because Lithos spends a lot of time um, black boxing all of the hard calculations that make this work very efficiently and safely um, and handling that for our farmers. So we're live on about 6,000 acres across America and also in some other countries today. Next slide. So why um, why lithos? A few different things. One, it's very scalable. Some calculations show that it could capture up to 5 to 10 billion tons of CO2 a year if you deployed this on all croplands worldwide. And that's not even talking about all other arable lands like forests and golf courses and other things. Um, two, we actually can already capture carbon today for about one-fifth um, the cost of certain other atmospheric carbon dioxide solutions. And that's because we're using a waste dust. It's upcycled. Um, if you're very careful about your unit economics, you can actually get this to work, and there are farms everywhere, um, you know, humans eat. Um, another thing that we're really excited about is also making this very rapid so that we can also measure the carbon removal we're doing. One of the things that Lithos holds um, very uh, sacred is the fact that we think that everything in this early stage of this enhanced weathering market should be empirically and directly verified. So we actually measure on every single field that we deploy how much of the rock is dissolving, better understanding the bicarbonates that we're creating and fleshing out into the ecosystem, which have other benefits like deacidifying rivers and oceans, and we actually do this on every single one of our fields. So today, from actually in the last four months alone, we've uh, pulled about 6,000 different soil cores from every single one of our farms, and those are going through our laboratories today, where we're able to um, verify that our process is working, that we're dissolving this rock, that carbon is being captured. Um, of the last slide. So overall, in short, um, we're focused on a method that's very scalable, hopefully very cost effective and also very permanent and excited to have a conversation with you guys about your thoughts on the carbon removal markets and how this decade and the next few decades can scale. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> Given the title of our panel here today and really thinking towards this decade, I want to ask a question of all of you in relation to that. Slightly different questions for the three of you here. For the two entrepreneurs, what does scale look like for your organization over the next decade? How are you thinking about the critical nature of moving fast while also building trust in what you're doing? And then for Annie, um, if the next decade is indeed critical, 
should we care about permanent or thousand year durability for carbon storage? You want me to start? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so as you saw my earlier slide, we think about the durabilities very deliberately, and we think about what technologies, specifically on the nature based side, are encapsulated in there. And the reason that we don't try to weigh any technology over another, like I know there are researchers who are like, well, if we weight the value of this kind of carbon impact, then you can quantify an overall portfolio and then you have this thing. But I don't know if you can put a price on some of the ecological tipping points that we're trying to prevent. And um, so the way we've organized ourselves is high durability is, you know, a thousand years plus. And so a thousand years plus versus permanent, like that's all high durability to us. And that's all something that we care about as we think about market development. Um, and then when you think about the timing and what we need in this decade and the next up to 2050, up to uh, 2100, we think that we will probably end up stacking the different durabilities to make sure that we achieve the desired impacts that you know the IPCC calls for by 2050, et cetera. Um, but I, I think we're all in on everything high durability as long as it's over a thousand years for now. Um, I'll go next. Uh, the scale of the, uh, I mean, just think about how big an oil refinery is. Like uh, if, if anybody has been to one, they have their own zip codes. Some of them have several zip codes. That's one refinery. Um, they're, the, the size of the current oil, uh, oil and gas industry is, is massive. Um, and our, you know, our technology has the advantage of, you know, we, the type of reactors that we use and the type of, uh, processes that we use are actually drop in. So you can drop in, replace, you know, existing oil and gas equipment with, you know, our, uh, you know, with our sustainable aviation fuel technology. Um, however, that's, there is just so much of it. Um, and so in the next 10 years, we really need to, to displace at least, uh, at least a few percent of that uh, of that oil and gas infrastructure with sustainable infrastructure so what that looks like to my organization and many others in the carbon dioxide utilization space is it's a lot of capex it's a, it's a lot of putting steel in the ground um, and it's a lot of building uh, you know not just repurposing oil and gas assets but building um, you know, building green refineries that will make uh, sustainable fuels on scales that are, you know, um, that are tens of millions of gallons per, uh, you know, per unit or per refinery. Um, so within the next 10 years for, for, uh, for my industry uh, or my corner of the, the, the industry as compared to, you know, what Microsoft and, uh, and and Lithos are are doing, it really means a lot of build out of large plants um, and, and large facilities. Um, so along those lines, our company does carbon removal in the way that I like to sum it up to my friends and family when they're like, you should also reduce. I'm like, yes, absolutely, you should reduce. As I think of CDR as a mop. You don't want to mop up a flood. That would be a disaster that's not going to work very well. And we need to turn off, you know, the faucet running in the bathtub. And then we also need a mop. We need both things, right? Um, but when you look at the scale of the CDR, need, or sorry, the carbon dioxide removal needed, it is in the billions of tons. And humanity is really in the thousands of tons today. And so we need to move a lot faster in the scale of the solutions that we are deploying. And at the same time, in order for this market to endure, in order for folks like Microsoft and for other players in the space to really get the credit that they deserve for looking for high quality removals, we also need to keep a high standard across the bar for what credibility means and trust and transparency in the market. So those are the two things I think about. We need to scale. We also need credibility. One of the things I worry about a lot as a founder is the fact that if there isn't credibility in the markets, and I think probably Probably some of this room has seen all those Bloomberg Green articles that have come out, you know, decrying carbon offsets in some cases. Um, if there isn't credibility in the market, then it will be a lot harder to deploy these technologies from an investment perspective, from a buyer's perspective. So one of the things we think about a lot is how do we build really robust MRV that is pure, um, pure reviewed, that is verified with third-party independent sources, that is actually very careful and sensitive to the fact that, you know, these open systems are very complex in reality. So a quick model, at least today, doesn't 
doesn't really cut it. And so those are the things that we think about at Lithos. How do we verify that we are capturing carbon, prove that to the folks who are interested in buying those carbon offsets, and help establish a rigorous, trustworthy base for the market as we all work on scaling fast? Thank you. I'm going to ask you all a few more questions, and we're going to open it up to the audience. So get your questions ready, everybody. Um, Okay, here's a, I'm going to throw you a, another little softball, sort of, but then I, I do have one that I, I'm very curious about your take on that I, might be a slightly more controversial question. Um, the, we're talk, we've talk, heard about the solutions you're building, the economics around them, the needs of them. Uh, we have an esteemed buyer in the panel today. But what is the role of carbon markets more broadly? What needs to shift to make them work as well as they could? And what is their role, perhaps, in your individual companies? Echoing what Mary just ended with, I think quality is first and foremost uh, front of mind for us, because one of the major constraints, in addition to financing, in addition to policy, is that people don't know what good looks like. Um, and I think a lot of the controversy that we hear about with offsets is a product of crossing some threshold, like with the VERA registry, and, and, and VERA has a bunch of different methodologies. Some of those methodologies are very stringent, and some of them kind of just pass muster. Um, and I think we see a similar parallel happening in the renewable energy space, which a lot of our carbon removal procurement and contracting, the terms and conditions we put in our contracts, those are borrowed from what we've learned in the renewable energy procurement space. Uh, certainly within Microsoft, perhaps for other buyers as well. Um, and so when we go and evaluate a project, there's no written rule for what good looks like beyond that VERA methodology in a lot of cases. And for bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, for DAC, director capture, there are no certifications in existence. So when you think about biomass-based carbon removal, you have to scrutinize the supply chain of that biomass waste that is the input to your system. And of FSC certification uh, for, for a stewardship council certification, which is global, doesn't necessarily mean anything if you're sourcing from, let's say, Estonia or Romania, where you don't trust that the rule of law and the compliance and the enforcement is there. So then when you're a buyer and you're thinking about, A, the goal that you've committed to, to, to meeting, and you're thinking about, B, your headlines, um, it would look really bad for our reputation if we went and procured a product where we didn't scrutinize what the source of that biomass was, nor have a means to continually measure, monitor, uh, enforce if needed, that that supply chain is intact and sustainable per whatever criteria you've set. And so quality and trust building are probably the main thing many of the folks we talk to um, discuss. And even for the, the sellers, the intermediaries, the brokers, they have entire like trust verticals as they're trying to figure out like how do we promote what good looks like and define that more broadly. I think there's a lot of work to do within the industry to align on what good likes pathway by pathway so that the market believes it and the financiers therefore believe it. And when policymakers say, like the US government announced they're going to set up or try to set up a green procurement pathway for carbon removal, like how can they do that if they don't know what good looks like? And so I think it all starts from quality and then the money will come and the policy will also be there alongside. Yeah, echoing very much what Annie said there, I think that uh, there's a couple points I would like to make. So one of them is that science is really, really hard. Um, you know, like we, we all know this. Uh, things don't always work the exact same way when you scale out of different pilots. Um, things for us don't work this exact same way when we work in different fields. And I think that's one of the challenges that the sort of nature-based market, which is inherently very scalable, if you think about trees, they, they do grow, right? Um, that is one of the challenges that the nature-based market and other markets have seen. The fact that things are not always very reliable. You think you plant a tree, they may not survive. Like I studied a bunch of forestry when I was thinking about what is the best pathway for doing CDR or for doing mass carbon removal at scale. And so I think that's something that we should be very open about. We should tackle the hard questions as early as possible. And, and that means today or, or yesterday, right? And so I think that it actually behooves all of us in this room and folks who are in the space to ask those really hard questions, just like Microsoft and some other buyers are doing. Really dive into the science, consult the right experts, and understand that things are 
and not always a neat, perfect picture. Like it works in theory, it may not work in practice. And I am confident that if we can do this, we can actually scale this market. The second thing I was going to say is that the carbon offsets market right now is still very nascent. We're so excited about um, buyers like Microsoft, Frontier Climate, Swiss Re, others in the space. But at the same time, they're only starting to scratch the surface and they're really leading the charge today for others. But there's also a massive opportunity for other folks, whether that's university endowments or other large, um, you know, other large industries to start stepping in, dipping their toes in the water, and think about what it might mean to offset their emissions and also provide funding and investment to um, solutions like ours and to other ones out there to help this market scale. Because the faster we remove the carbon, the less damage it's doing up there. And if things get pretty bad, like there are secondary, um, second order feedback loops in, in um, the natural ecosystem, if things get bad, 10 years later, it will be more expensive and more challenging to remove that carbon. So we really do want to accelerate and forward deploy as much as possible while also keeping credibility. Um, and then I figured I'd jump in last because for fuels, it's it's, it's a little bit different than for, for uh, carbon removal. Um, so for fuels, uh, every, every fuel out there has what's called a CI score. Um, that is the, the, um, grams of CO2 equivalent that are emitted per megajoule of fuel that you have. Um, and there's a CI score, which is the extent CI just stands for carbon intensity, a CI score for fossil fuels, diesel, gasoline, jet. There's a CI score for blend stocks or biofuels. So I'm sure everybody here or most people here drive a car. When you go to gas up your car, you see that there's a sticker, uh, you know, that says 10% ethanol, uh, you know, on the, on the fuel pump. Um, well, that 10% ethanol is a biofuel and that comes from renewable fuel standards in the United States. And those renewable fuel standards govern the, the CI scores and the credits that those fuel producers get. Uh, for selling their biofuel or the blender's tax credits for blending them in with the fossil fuel base. Um, and that CI score, how it's calculated is, you know, is actually, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, subjectivity in it, um, unfortunately. Uh, so there are obviously different types of renewable fuels, biofuels, but what we do at air companies called power to liquids. Um, how you classify your renewable energy inputs, how you classify the land use changes by switching from, you know, forestry to agriculture, or switching from a, um, you know, a, a, another carbon uh, removal solution um, that go into the calculation of these CI scores. So it's an entire, I mean, you know, like you could, there are entire, uh, you know, uh, college courses on this. Um, I see Julie Zimmerman nodding. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are, uh, there's a lot that go into calculating the, the CI score for, for a fuel, but that's how fuels are, are, are really kind of governed in their carbon impact um, and the, the, the I would say the one t one takeaway uh, just going back to a little bit of a, a science lesson um, for fuels um, the best you can do is zero so that means carbon neutral is the best you can do because you're, you're making a fuel right so you're using carbon dioxide to make a carbon-based fuel um, you, you then are combusting the fuel at some point and so the the carbon goes back into the air um, so uh, the, what we're all striving for is a, is a CI score as close to zero as possible. And there are ways that some groups can creatively do math to have negative CI scores. Um, but, you know, if, if, if you're like me and you believe in the first law of physics, um, then it's, not, it's, it's, it's not, not really that possible. So what we're really trying to do is make fuels carbon neutral. Um, now, products, on the other hand, and carbon removals can be carbon negative. Uh, so there is a way to make things, uh, you know, uh, but depending on long-term durability of the storage and, and, and other factors, there is a way to make things that are carbon negative, plastics as well. Um, you know, but in the, in the fuels space, it's we look at the, the CI score of the fuel and how that compares to the fossil fuel <laughs> CI score. Thank you all. I'm, I'm realizing where we've gotten to in, in terms of time, so I do want to open it, throw it out to the audience right now to see if there's some burning questions. Right there in the top row, we have two. Let's see if we have, right, how about you, right there on the right? Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned you have sort of partners in agriculture and in transportation. I'm wondering if just in the landscape there are people who are partnering with the general industry and what their solutions are. 
Yeah, um, so a few of them aren't uh, public yet, but one of the ones that is public, so we work for uh, example with Yara Agriculture. It's like a 105-year-old agriculture company, actually the first company in the world to ever create synthetic nitrogen, which is the main input in farms today. And we're excited to be deploying on their acres. We also work with some well-known producers of potatoes and other other crops across America. We work with Cotton Inc. as well. Um, they grow cotton and they certify cotton. So uh, I think that's actually a really exciting channel for us. Um, you want to go for scale here, right? We don't want to do it all ourselves. And right now we have a very close relationship with every single farmer we work with. But especially as we talk about accelerating the scale of the solution, there's so much potential to plug into the fact that agriculture has to happen. We are not robots yet, despite GPT-4. Um, and we need to eat. And we should try our best to decarbonize the food that we're growing. So there's a lot of exciting partners that we're excited to work with, both um, domestically and also internationally. So we're actually live in a few different countries as well. Um, yeah, I, I guess I could I could jump in on that. That um, you know the the decarbonizing transportation is going to require a lot of a portfolio of solutions. I mean, there's we just kind of had the slide with so showed there's no silver bullet, silver bullet for climate change and transportation emissions is a is a huge chunk of that. Um, so as far as like how that interacts with agriculture, there's electrification. Um, you know, there's also for long for you know long haul. Uh, you know, uh, not just. Uh, flights, but also for uh, you know for boats, uh, high, higher energy density liquid fuels that are lower, uh, you know that can be made from carbon dioxide or are lower carbon intensity than what the existing uh, you know status quo is. The, the big, the big, the big one, uh, you know, the big, the big, uh, I would say, like the point to take home on the transportation side is right now all you know all of the carbon is coming from the ground, and we're refining crude oil into the transportation fuels we use, and then it's going into the air. And can we get that carbon from other sources, um, whether it's bio-based or, uh, you know, or, or engineered, uh, you know, solutions, powder liquid solutions like ours? In order of how I saw them before, we'll go. Yeah, thank you. Extremely interesting. Uh, I'm curious. On the one hand, this looks like very new markets, right? But could you tell a little bit more about the competition? Uh, at the local scale, at the national scale, at the global scale, and do you have any cooperations within your verticals, with your competitors, and uh, across the verticals? I can start, yeah, real quickly with that. I mean, there's there's a lot of collaborations that have to happen, uh, you know, for for the, for what we're doing, um, you know. So, our feedstocks, carbon dioxide, green hydrogen. There are tons of companies out there that are producing new technologies for green hydrogen. Um, that also ties into um, that. That also ties into what Mary was saying before about uh, ammonia. Right now, fertilizer is produced, you, you know, uh, via the Haber Bosch process. That means you take uh, hydrogen that's produced from natural gas, and you take nitrogen that's just captured from the air. Um, you put them to get you. You mix those gases together. You put them in a hot tube, and out comes the ammonia. Um, uh, that's a simplification. But uh, the 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 point of the point of the point of that is that it's uh, you have to use natural gas to get your hydrogen. Um, if you can get your hydrogen from renewable electricity and water, then you've decarbonized ammonia production, which is a huge percent of, uh, you know, of, of global carbon dioxide emissions. Um, you know, so there's there is a lot there is a lot of interdependency, um, you know, on different aspects of the you know of the ecosystem. I think for all of our for all of our solutions. Um, you know, there are ways to insulate the risk, uh, and we do a lot to insulate risk on what if green hydrogen disappears tomorrow? What other, you know, sources can we use? Um, you know, but I would say that um, the competitive landscape right now looks like um, for sustainable fuels, um, there is such a demand. There's a demand for, like, we need to make four billion gallons of sustainable aviation fuel by 2030 and right now we're only make, right now there's only like 40 million production capacity in the entire world so this the the demand far outstrips the supply um, and so there's a lot of room for various different technologies i think in the, in the power to liquid space we have a lot of advantages over other power to liquids technologies other power to liquids technologies though um, have been around since the 19 early 1920s um, and so it depends on, do you want to, I mean, my argument whenever I'm kind of pitching your company is like, well, there are a lot of things that we have today that we didn't have in the 1920s, like cell phones, antibiotics. We all like things like those. Um, 
So why use the old technology when we have new, more efficient technology? Um, but, uh, you know, there are people that are much more risk averse and want to go to use the older technologies. Um, so um, I would say the competitive landscape gives buyers a lot of options. Um, but there's, in, in sustainable fuels, the demand is essentially infinite compared to the supply because the supply is negligible right now. Um, so there's room for a lot of different solutions. For one more, go ahead. Yes. yes, hi. I wanted to ask you have you looked into biofuels? Um, you know, like there's some oil bearing seeds. One of them that is one of the most promising for converting the plant oil into biodiesel is Jatropha. You know, it sort of grows a lot in Caribbean countries. Uh, at some point, it can also be used for lighting. They were using it in the Philippines a while back. Uh, there were also experiments recycling just, you know, old-fashioned cooking grease. They were doing it in Europe and transforming it into biodiesel. It wouldn't be good for aviation, but it could be good for cars. So do you know anything about that? It, so that's right now all the sustainable aviation fuel on the planet is is called HEFA, HEFA SAF, um, and uh, the the last two letters in HEFA stand for fatty acid. Uh, so right now, actually, all the SAF in the world is made via processes like you're like you're describing, not not from that specific oil, but from waste vegetable oils um, and tallow, for example. So you know, animal fat. Um, the two there's only two companies that are doing it right now, and it's a very old technology. Um, you know, where essentially they just take the oil and they, again, put it into a tube with hydrogen. Um, that's a very common theme in oil and gas. You take your product and put it in a tube with hydrogen and you get your fuel out. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the, that, that, that sort of SAF is actually the most common type uh, of sustainable aviation fuel, and renewable diesel is co-produced with it. Um, the companies that do that are called Neste. Neste is a oil and gas company. Uh, they're based in Finland. Um, their supply chain is very complicated, and their feedstock is very limited because they have to get waste vegetable oil from like restaurants. Um, and then another company called World Energy that uses tallow. Um, again, they're uh, you're, you're you're flying off of like cow fat, uh, so the um, the demand is is the the amount of the amount of tallow that's out there uh, is not really large enough to supply all the all the sustainable aviation fuel that's needed. Um, but yeah, Neste and World Energy are the two largest, the two only producers of commercial sustainable aviation fuel uh, today. Um, you know, we produce uh, non-commercial. We produce for defense today. We're building our first commercial plant currently. Uh, I have a little bit of a different question. Um, so you all talked about a lot of technology. Uh, I'm sure all of us understood that. Um, so if I'm Joe Harper living in Hartford, it's in a uh, low housing uh, society, how are you conveying the message of climate change and sustainability to a very common man and making them be aware that, you know, yeah, technology is good and we can all talk about it until the cows come home, but how is the common man, um, you know, realizing it and, and taking some action? Uh, with Microsoft as a large corporation and two uh, small uh, companies. <laughs> well, one of the things that we try to put front and center as far as our values and our ethos goes is like we build products and tools for individuals and for companies around the world. And so as we think about how we design those tools and our programs, we're asking ourselves, how can we go further because we have the capacity and the resources to do so? And how can we empower other people to move faster forward in the capacity that they choose to or want to. And so when you transpose that down to the ground, there's a couple different facets um, to our engagement. One is in the communities that we serve, I'm thinking about our data center communities more specifically, we have programming that looks at workforce development and upskilling for the digital transformation and economy. Um, when we think about the tools we build, we have a lot of like education and health and other oriented uh, programs that try to 
upskill folks in those spaces so that they know how to live in this digital age. Um, so those are some of the ways that we're trying to translate what we do at different levels, company and individual, in the communities we serve and the communities we are neighbors in. And just to pipe in really quickly there, so um, another thing that I want to, I think part of your question is also asking about engagement and how do we engage other communities, not just like technologists or folks who work in labs um, in climate change and in developing solutions there. That's something we're very passionate about at Lithos Carbon. We work with smallholder farmers, we work with large farmers, we work with farmers, right? Rural, folks who live in rural areas. My family are farmers as well. And I think one of the interesting things for me is going out to these farms, talking to them. Some of them are very, very into the idea of like, we need to tackle climate change, like there are droughts in my farm, like this is a massive problem. Some of them might sit on the other side of the political spectrum and that's totally fine. But the cool thing is that across the across the entire spectrum, we see that people are interested in being part of the general solution, being part of the conversation, right? And I think that one of the key things to think about here as we talk about scalability is how do we plug into existing systems, existing frameworks, existing infrastructures to make a difference um, with the lowest activation energy possible. Um, and I think that trying to figure out how do you build cross-functional solutions for different parts of society and different um, segments of industry is honestly how we tackle this at scale. Yeah, we sell vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to learn more about that question, 130, literally the world expert on climate change communication and public opinion and polling, Tony will be here to talk about that for 40 minutes. So like you can dig in and learn more about that topic specifically. Um, please join me in thanking our panel for the discussion today. We're gonna take a quick break. Um, uh, Julie Zimmerman right here in the front row will start back up in just a few minutes. So stretch, um, and if you'd like to talk to our panelists, they'll be gonna be heading outside. Um, <laughs> So, 
And where do you live? Uh, in New York. In New York. Yeah. yeah. Where? Yeah. 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 Yeah.